Good day. Today we're going to be looking at the second half of the book of Ezekiel, which is looking at the, the overarching theme of new creation, of having soft hearts, and that there will be a new earth in the age to come. So I just want to give you a quick overview of the second half of the book of Ezekiel. We've got uh, chapter 34, which is a prophecy of a, a new David, the, the pointing forward to Jesus as the son of David. Uh, we've got chapter 36 about a new Israel with their new heart. Chapter 37 about that valley of dry bones, you know, that's um, it's dead and then God brings it back to life. Um, there's, you know, only one hope for God to remake humans so that we might love God and love our neighbour. So in chapters 38 and 39, we've got judgment upon Gog, who's an archetype of human rebellion and evil empire. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Chapters 40 to 48 is the new temple, as it find its ultimate fulfilment in the church. Chapters 47 to 48 is the new Eden, a, a new earth, a new heavens and a new earth. So one of the major themes running through this book is new creation. In Ezekiel 34, um, verses 23 24 it says this i will place over them one shepherd my servant david and he will tend them he will tend them and be their shepherd i the lord will be their god and my servant david will be prince among them i the lord have spoken so he's not meaning here david himself but rather from someone from david's line this is the davidic king and it's pointing ultimately to the lord jesus christ someone's from david's line will be established as king over the entire earth, all of creation. Uh, the Lord will be their God and David will be their king. So there's this theme of new creation through the son of David that is all over the New Testament. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we read, So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away, look. What is new has come. Now, that might not be your, your lived reality. It might not feel like everything is new. But as I've said before, history is written from the perspective of the end. So the end is new heavens, new earth. You know, we're glorified. We've become like Christ. We're ruling and reigning over the cosmos with him. That is where we're heading. But we might not feel that now. Our present lived experience might not feel that way, but because God knows the end from the beginning, his knowledge is perfect. He knows that is what you are, that that is your future, your destiny, that is what's always been purposed and planned for you. Um, so that is set in stone, as it were. History is written in light of the end, okay? But you might not feel it, you might not understand it, but Paul says the old has passed, the new has come. Something has radically happened. Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through to 20, we read, In the speaking of Christ, he is before all things. And in him, so this is in Christ again, in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, which is the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile him to himself all things, whether in earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This speaks of Jesus as the son of David. And Paul says here, for God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. Uh, the the right. Uh, John in his gospel puts it this way he says that Jesus has the spirit without measure without measure we might have a little bit and a little bit of understanding but Jesus has the spirit without measure without measure he's God is pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and Paul writes he's the beginning the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy Jesus is the beginning of the new creation because he's the firstborn the firstborn from among the dead so the new creation is on the other side of death 
death is part of the process is part of the process of you reaching your full potential your full destiny which is to become a son or daughter of the living god and that is only reached through death okay so first corinthians chapter 15 verse 36 paul writes this fool what you sow will not come to life unless it dies. So this is, he's using the analogy of planting seeds that have to then die before a plant comes up. And he's saying this, this stuff, flesh and blood, it needs to die before we can then be born immortal, as it were. Um, changed or transformed, however we want to talk about that. So Psalm 104 verses 29 to 30 says this, When you take away their breath, they die and they return to dust. But when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So new creation follows from death. As the psalmist said, they are created after they die and return to the dust. It is part of the process part of the process so first corinthians chapter 15 verse 50 paul writes i declare to you brothers and sisters flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable it's a totally different set of circumstances it's not like it's just this earth but it's a new heavens a new earth where we're made of imperishable stuff not stuff that dies that fades that that um is part of the process as it were so Romans chapter 8, verses 28, 29. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I love this passage. I love it. It's beautiful. Jesus is the first of many brothers and sisters. You you will be like him in the age to come. C.S. Lewis um, described it as if we swore ourselves as we will be, we would be tempted to worship ourselves. OK, it's we will be raised immortal, glorious beings who will live and rule and reign into the age to come. We will be like him in the age to come. He's the first of many brothers and sisters in all things he has the preeminence as paul says so paul in romans 8 talks about all of creation groaning in childbirth waiting for the births of the sons and daughters of god that's the resurrection the remaking of the cosmos all of creation is in childbirth groaning until we're given birth to until we're raised immortal what a glorious thought what a glorious thought a world no longer under the control of evil spirits, but restored under God's control under his Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Soft hearts, friends. We need soft hearts. We looked at that a little bit last week. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. We need soft hearts, folks not hard hearts. Is your heart soft today? Is your heart soft today? Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Friends, from the very foundation of the earth, God has had a plan to use Jesus Christ to create for himself a family for all eternity. Adam was created as a copy of Jesus who is yet to appear in Romans 5. The serpent's lie was that Adam could become like God by his independence from God, whilst the gospel tells us that we will be like God through Jesus Christ by giving up our independence, by choosing rather to become clay in the potter's hands, to allow him to shape and mould us according to his purposes, to say, not my will, but your will be done. We should have that same attitude in us, Paul says in Philippians 2. It's not independence, but rather total dependence. In the fall, humanity forgot what it meant to image God, to represent him into the world. And so the word of God took on flesh to show humanity what God is like, restoring the image, showing us the likeness of God. 
In so doing, God restores us to himself, setting us in right relationship with the world. In his mercy, God removed us from Eden so that we would not die, so that we might die, sorry, so that we might die and be clothed in these fleshly skins, that we might learn dependence upon him, so that if you can get sick and you can die, you can also be healed and restored. It is part of the process. Imagine if we were immortal beings who didn't die and yet were fallen unable to turn back to God because of our hard hearts. No, he makes us soft like clay so that we might turn to him. Deuteronomy 32, 39, God says, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. Notice the order. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. This is the order of life. Death, then resurrection. Death, then resurrection. God's purpose for your life is that you would become like Jesus. As John Baer says, he says, he shows us what it is to be God by the way that he dies as a man. OK, that's talking of Christ. He shows us what it is to be God by the way he dies as a man, to know what it is to image, to have the likeness of God. By looking at how he dies as a man in self-sacrificial love for the other. The purpose of this mortal life is therefore repentance and turning of our hearts and minds to God, to learn for our need for God, to become soft and moldable like clay. Hard pottery smashes, it breaks, it can be destroyed while soft clay is moldable. It can be changed, directed, refined, formed into something beautiful. So God knows that you don't have it all together. He knows that you're not the finished uh, project. He knows that you get it wrong. He, that's just being human. That's part of this condition, this fallen condition. Um, that is being flesh and blood. We're perishable. We're weak. We're feeble. And yet he's remaking us through his spirit into that which will endure forever. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's beautiful. One of the major themes in Ezekiel is God's judgment upon the nations and the restoration of the earth. We see in Ezekiel 38, we see God's victory over the nations. It's depicted as this this battle against Gog, the prince of Magog, and God allows uh, Gog to invade Israel only to be defeated, and he shows how powerful he is in protecting his people. Now this story is told again in Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9, and we read, Now when the thousand years are finished, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to bring them together for the battle. They are as numerous as the grains of sand on the sea. They went up on the broad plain of the earth and encircled the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them completely. So in Revelation's version of events, this battle takes place after the millennium when Satan has been released from prison. And it is Satan who gathers Gog and Magog for battle. Uh, th these figures, Gog and Magog, became the centre of many legends. And by the time of the Roman period, it was thought in the imagination that it was Alexander the Great had been told by God to build a great wall of iron to keep Gog and Magog prisoners until the end of time. Oh, great foresight there, Alexander. Um, so the Jewish historian Josephus explains them to be the Scythians who lived in what is today sort of Ukraine, Russia and the Central Asian republics. They're the, the people of the steppes, the people who live in the in the Central Asian steppes. Uh, in this version of events, it's this version of events that is um, found in the Quran, the holy book of Islam as well, where Dolok 9, Alexander the Great, builds this great wall in order to keep Gog and Magog from civilization until the final hour, until the last battle. So Ezekiel 38 15 and 16 we read 
Uh, you will come from your place in the far north, you and the many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people, Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me and I am proved holy through you before their eyes. So they come from, quote, the far north. In Hebrew, this is Zaphon, uh, the false god Baal dwelt in Zaphon, Mount Zaphon, and is called, therefore, Lord of the North. And these people, therefore, represent a supernatural enemy that is directing human affairs in order to destroy Zion, the holy hill, you know, the Mount Zion, the, the eternal city. There we go. So as Revelation says, it's Satan, who's, you know, Baal here, who gathers the nations for the battle against the Lord's Christ. OK, so throughout the Middle Ages, Gog and Magog, various identified through different peoples, the Vikings, the Huns, the Khazars, the Mongols, uh, other nomad groups, even the lost ten tribes of Israel. Um, as Revelation 20 verse 9 makes it clear that the location of the battle is Jerusalem. They went up, this is quoting, they went up on the broad plain of the earth and encircled the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them completely. It's this reason why commentators take the, the word Armageddon that appears earlier in the book. And I think it refers to Harmoed, or the mountain of assembly. Um, so Mount Zion, Jerusalem itself, rather than the plain of Jezreel. So whatever the case might be, Gog and his armies are defeated. The world is remade as a new Eden. So Revelation 21, verse 1, reads this way. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had ceased to exist. Verses 2 to 4. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look. The residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will not exist anymore. Nor mourning or crying or pain for the former things have ceased to exist. How wonderful is that? Well, that's a wonderful image, isn't it? You know, no more crying or pain. Those former things have just ceased to exist. Verses 22 to 27. Now I saw no temple in the city because the Lord God, the all-powerful, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of the Lord lights it up. Its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light. The kings of the earth will bring grandeur into it. Its gates will never be closed during the day and there will be no night there. They will bring the grandeur and wealth of the nations into it, but nothing richly unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we're told here that the, the glory of God lights it up and the lamp is the Lamb. So the Lamb that is Jesus the Messiah is the lamp through which God's glory lights up the entire world city he's the lamp through which the glory of god lights up the city revelation chapter eleven fifteen puts it this way and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he will reign forever and ever so the end of the story is the everlasting kingdom of the lord god and of his christ his anointed one his messiah so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, we read, And when all things are subject to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God might be all in all. And that, that's the end, isn't it? That's the end. The vision is that through the reign of Christ, through the reign of the Messiah, through the reign of the anointed Son of David, that all things that will now become filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea, as Habakkuk says. So it's that God would be all in all through the reign of his Messiah. God will be all in all. That's your destiny. That's your future. 
That's what's ahead of you. Are you going to be filled with the knowledge and the glory of God? That's a wonderful, wonderful thought. Jesus here is referred to as the Son, the Son of God. And this is a messianic title. John tells us in John 20, 31, these things were written. This is his gospel. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. The idea is rooted in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 verses 6 and 7 says this. As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The apostles quote this verse many, many times throughout the New Testament. And it's the, the, the son of God is the Davidic king, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. As the Lord says, you are my son, today I've begotten you. He's the king who's been set over Zion. Okay, so it's the the son of God is the Messiah. Okay, that's what John's saying. That he's trying to convince them, writing his gospel, he's trying to convince people that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. So it's a royal title and he will rule over God's kingdom forever and ever. That's why Hebrews, the book of Hebrews said that God has made him his heir. He's the heir of all things. Okay. So Jesus is also called Lord from Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This verse is quoted more than any other in the New Testament. This is the verse, as it were. And here speaks of Jesus, as Paul says, of receiving the kingdom of God. That's what Paul's alluding to when he talks about these things. He says, the Lord says to my Lord, which is why we call Jesus Lord. He's the second Lord there. Um, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. So friends, we will be part of this everlasting kingdom. Don't get caught up with all of the bad news stories of today. We're going to be part of something far better than this world ruled over by those evil powers, those evil principalities. You know, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. They're going. OK, we're the ones who are going to rule and reign in the age to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, as Ezekiel tells us, we're headed towards the new creation. Jesus is the beginning of that new creation because he's the firstborn from the dead. And friends, we're called to have soft hearts, to be clay in the potter's hands. And each of us will have our final home in the new earth where we will reign with Christ forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that we might be captivated by that vision that you in eternity past planned for every single one of us to be brought through your Messiah into your kingdom. That we would be adopted as your sons and heirs, joined heirs, co-heirs with Christ, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, that we will rule and reign with him in the age to come having glorious immortal bodies, that you've planned and purposed all this even before the foundations of the earth, that through him you would do all of this. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your, your speaking by your spirit to all of the um, prophets in the Old Testament, showing them signs and symbols leading to that event, and that in the death and resurrection of the Messiah, you have undone death itself. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this in the name of your Son, who is our Lord. Amen.